welcome to the worship service of the First Baptist Church of Marion, Illinois. Located just two blocks west of Tower Square near downtown Marion, this vibrant and energetic church meets weekly for high-energy, Christ-centered services. Enjoy the warm fellowship of the First Baptist family. We pray God's Spirit will be evident in our service and that you will want to come and see what First Baptist of Marion is all about.
Let's sing these words together. Better yet, let's pray these words to our Lord today. Would you do that with me? Let's pray together. forgot about him being there but you never slipped his mind he's living off the of scraps of you you never knew you left behind and as the sun goes down he rises with a smile he's 
waiting on the night to fall The old man's coming to call But you don't see the writing on the wall He'll never step out in the light Now he's just biding time And while you slumber He's gonna come and take it all He's waiting on the night to fall Waiting on the night to fall He knows you have the answers But truth lies dusty on your shelf And the sword that you could slay him with Has become an ornament and nothing else You could put him back down in his hole in the ground But he knows you never will He's been around so long you got used to the smell He's waiting on the night to fall The old man's coming to call But you don't see the writing on the wall He'll never step out in the light No, he's just biding his time And while you slumber He's gonna come and take it all He's waiting on the night to fall He's waiting on the night to fall He knows he'll never have your soul But he will gladly rob you blind And while you're feasting at his table He'll tie your hands and numb your mind He'll take you farther than you want to go He'll keep you longer than you want to stay And it will cost you more than you ever thought you'd pay He's waiting on the night to fall The old man's coming to call But you don't see the writing on the wall He'll never step out in the light Now he's just biding his time And if you slumber He's gonna come and take it all He's waiting on the night to fall He's waiting on the night to fall He's waiting on the night waiting on the night to fall The old man's coming to call But you don't see, you don't see Riding on the wall He's waiting on the night He's waiting on the night to fall He's waiting on the night to fall Thanks, Kevin. Man, I was reading in the back of the book here just to get myself ready after hearing that one. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Woo! Well, I'm glad that's in there. Because what he was sharing with us in that song is absolutely right. There's an enemy out there, and he wants to destroy you. Nothing would make him any happier than to destroy you because that would hurt God. Because God loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. And that's how much he loves you and how much he wants to protect you and love you. So, wow, Kevin, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Well, I'm not going to do this, but let's just say that I did. Let's just say that I would give anybody $100 if they could come up and recite word for word a poem for me. 
did you hear me say I'm not going to do that? I don't have $100, so I can't do that. But uh, I, I know at least one person that could. My wife learned Paul Revere's last ride back when you were that old. Okay, uh, in grade school, and uh, she could recite uh, that whole poem. Don't know if you could do it now, but uh, she could probably get most of it. But let me help you a little bit, because most of you really do know how to recite some poetry. After teaching a uh, summer course in Colorado Springs, Colorado, a lady by the name of Catherine Lee Bates and some other professors at the end of the semester decided they were going to go up to the top of Pikes Peak and what they called an, uh, a merry expedition. And when they got up there, oh, by the way, it was in 1893, and they went up by, by a wagon to get there. And they got up there, and she was so awestruck by what she saw that a poem started formulating in her mind. And she looked at the skies, and she looked at the, uh, uh, the vast expanse that she could see and the beauty. And so she began to write. And if you all would like to recite this poem with me, you can. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties, above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. This was written as a poem, not as a song. The tune came later. It was a tune to something else, and they thought it sounded better with this. But let me just say to you that all of us know some poetry and we should thank God that we're blessed to live in a country with such a diverse beauty that literally from sea to shiny sea, we have shown God, we, we have the evidence of God's creative ability. Abraham Lincoln, when he was president, said this. And, and remember, he wrote this during the Civil War. He said, I can see how it might be possible for a, a, a man or woman to look down upon the earth and be an atheist. But I cannot conceive how he could look up into the heavens and say, there is no God. I remember visiting my sister and brother-in-law in Delray Beach, Florida when I was a teenager. And I remember the first time that I saw the ocean. We didn't have any oceans in Ullen. Uh, I'd never seen one except on television. But I remember the first time that I saw the sun setting down and shining in the ocean. And I thought, wow, that is just marvelously beautiful. And it's almost like the sun dipped itself into the ocean and uh, you kind of expected uh, you know, smoke to come up as it went into the water. So beautiful. Today we're going to be talking about Psalm 19. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 14. And the main idea today is that God made himself known to man through natural revelations in the physical creation and through supernatural revelation in the scriptures. So let's take a look at what uh, the psalmist uh, David said to us in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Ah, oh, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? 
Cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's pray together. Father, we all realize that everybody that's ever lived on this planet, if they look for you, they will find you. They will see you. They will see you in nature. They will see you in your creative ability, your ability to hold everything together. Father, the beauty that we do not believe could happen by chance, but we believe it was made to happen on purpose by you, our Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit working to create out of nothing. And Father, we just pray that today that hopefully uh, everyone here will see you, see you in the baptism, hear about you in the singing and the preaching and the praying, and everything will work together for good that those watching by television and those that are in this place today, all of us will realize the revelation of God, of yourself, and that we will know that you are God. And I pray if there's someone here that needs to be saved or has been saved and never baptized, that today would be the day that they would commit themselves. Maybe some are looking for a church family to be a part of. Lord, I pray that as this message goes forth, that everybody will be convicted to do what you want us to do and that we will say, as these three that were baptized this morning said, Jesus is my Lord. I will listen and I will obey. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the first thing that we see as we take a look at this uh, psalm, which is one of my favorite psalms, especially that very last verse, we see the revelation of God in what we see. The revelation of God in what we see. God has made himself known to man through supernatural revelation in the physical creation. And if you take a look, the revelation of God can be seen in the heavens. The heavens declare the glory of God. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I do declare? You ever heard that before? Or it may sound more like this, well, I do declare. You know where that came from? Not the South. The South picked it up and made it famous. But that's not where it came from. It came from Britain. Because everybody in Britain had to swear allegiance to the crown. And here's what they would say. I do declare that no foreign prince, person, prelate, statue, a potentate, hath or ought to have any jurisdiction, power, superiority, preeminence of authority, ecclesiastical or spiritual with this, within this realm, so help me God. That's where the little phrase came from. I do declare. And what it meant was, I do declare that I will have no other allegiances besides the crown but in our case I do declare I will have no other allegiances but my God who is in heaven I do declare now that gives you a whole new picture of that word I do declare I see God everywhere Isaac Watts wrote this nature with open volume stands to spread her master's praise abroad matter of fact the verbs here actually would say to keep on declaring. The heavens keep on declaring the glory of God. And the firmament keeps on showing or proclaiming his handiwork. You know, I, I know some people are very, very fond of cars. And, and when I see a car, one of the things that I always am trying to, to get in my head as I look at the car, I wonder who designed that car? What kind of car? Was it, uh, you know, the Ford Motor Company, or was it Chevrolet, or Chrysler, or BMW, or Edsel? Well, probably not Edsel anymore. But you think, who designed this? And you know why you think that? Because the design is evident. It's evident that somebody designed this. They designed it well or they designed it poorly, but somebody designed it. You can see it. And I have found that people pretty much see what they want to see. Some to the, look to the heavens and say, well, it's beautiful, all right, thanks to chance and a whole lot of time. But that's not how I see it. And I understand that what I see, I see by faith. 
Because I believe that when God said in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, that's the, that's the verse that I start with, and that's how my life is, is formulated. Because when I see something, I see it like that, and it's by faith. By faith, I believe that God did it. I see the intelligent designer. I believe it's God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we find in his holy word. And I believe the heavens declare his glory. And notice what it says about the firmament. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Sometimes I look at the beautiful sunset. And on occasion, but not nearly as often, the sun rises. And think, today God, wow, you're just showing off. You are a master at creation. Nobody can hold a candle to what you have done and what you are doing. Now, the Jewish people were forbidden to worship creation because they were taught to worship the creator. You know, he said in, in the Ten Commandments, there shall be no other gods before me. You'll not create any idols. And, and, and so they didn't worship things or people or statues or, or uh, even the sun or the moon or the stars, they didn't worship that. God was very clear, you are not to worship creation, you are to worship the creator. Romans 1, 24 and 25 says, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. And what uh, the Holy Spirit was uh, having Paul say to that is, is that we are to admire God's creation, but we are to worship the creator. The revelation of God, it says here in this passage, uh, can be seen in day and night. The revelation of God has no language barriers or limits. Look at, look at what it says here in verse 3. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In, and what he's saying there is, is that you can see God in the world at large and, 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 and it doesn't need to be translated. When my daughter-in-law uh, on Skype calls back to Japan and talks to her family and she's talking in Japanese, I, I, don't, I, don't, have a, I don't know what she's saying. She might be saying, well, my funny father-in-law, you know. Uh, you know I, she might be saying it, but I don't know. Probably is. <laughs> but when you look at God's creation and you say, I wonder how all of this came to be. That's what the Bible, we're going to find out in a minute. That's what the Bible's for, is to help us understand who the creator is. Now, in light of the fact that God has made knowledge about himself so prevalent and so plain, Paul is justified in exercising uh, uh, this, this, this passage talking about the fact that you deserve the wrath of God if you reject what you see in the order of creation. And, and you know a lot of, you know, I don't know if you remember when you were a teenager, you probably never did this, I probably was the only one, but sometimes my mom and dad would come in and say, why didn't you do what I told you to do? And I would say, well, you didn't tell me to do that. Y'all have never used that, right? No, 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 you've never done that, but occasionally teenagers do that. Well, let's pretend, uh, you know, that, uh, that, we're, that the world is full of teenagers, and, and people are, 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 and this teenager has been said, now when you get home, don't forget to set the garbage out for the trash truck. That's two weeks in the world I've talked about garbage. I must be convicted of that. I don't know. But uh, uh, so on the way home, if we are to compare this with God's handiwork and what he has told us about himself, it would be like if this teenager is driving home, there would be three billboards saying, take out the garbage. Or whenever he got home, there would be a text message, there would be an email, and there would be a sign on the door walking into the house, take out the garbage. You see, God has made himself so evident to us their line has gone out through the whole earth. The message is seen in nature to the end of the world. We can see God if we look for him. 
The revelation of God is as evident as the sun in the sky. There's some fantastic metaphors used here in this poetic passage. Uh, the uh, message of God going forth is like the sun set in the tabernacle. It's like a bridegroom coming forth from his uh, uh, pavilion, radiant, glowing, beaming, bright. It's like a champion uh, running his course. He's strong and he's uh, uh, enduring, always moving forward. You see, nothing is hidden about God. The revelation of God is so evident, there's no excuse for not seeing it unless you turn your head and look away. I had a friend one time who got up and he was sharing his testimony. It's been several years ago and as he was sharing his testimony, he told about what he did. He said that I was a non-believer, I wasn't sure that there was a God, so one day I prayed a prayer. I said, God, if you're real, show me. None of you have ever prayed that, I'm sure. But I've known a lot of people that has prayed that. And so he said, if, if you're real, show me. Well, God doesn't have to show you anything ex other than what he's already done, okay? He doesn't have to. But in this guy's case, he said, as I uh, was leaving home, I was driving down the street, and all of a sudden I passed by a church, and I saw a cross up there. Well, I thought, you know, that doesn't mean anything. All, most churches have some kind of crosses around it somewhere. That, you know, I just happened to be passing that. That wasn't God. He said, then he drove a little further, and he saw how the power lines were just such, and he saw another cross. He said he encountered a, a, a lady in his work, and she was wearing a cross around her neck. And then he was driving home and he looked up in the sky and he saw a cloud that looked like a cross. And you're saying, well, that was just suggestive, you know. He was, you know, he was just thinking that. What I found interesting about that was, and what he said in his testimony was, it was for several weeks I saw a cross everywhere I went. To the point that I knew it was God. Y'all try that sometime. How many crosses can you see? You know, it, it's really kind of fascinating to do that. So I would give you a challenge. If you are having problems believing in God, just say, God, I am open to the possibility. Show me. Show me who you are. And then open your eyes. Remember we sing that song, uh, open my eyes, Lord. Open my eyes. And what he said at the end was this. He said, you know, everything that I saw was there all the time. There's a song written about that. Time after time, I was searching for peace in some void. I was trying to blame all of my ills on this world that I was in surface relationships used me till I was done in but all the while someone was begging me was begging to free me from sin he was there all the time waiting patiently in line he was there all the time the revelation of God is there Look for him, and you will see him. But praise God, he didn't stop there. He could have stopped there. He could have just said, look, can't you see in what I've created and the order in which I am allowing it to live in? You could see me there if you wanted to. But then the psalmist, and from verse 7 on, begins to talk about the word of God. He talks about the revelation of God in what we hear. Now look at verse 7. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Nature reveals that there is a glorious God and creator. Scripture reveals who this God is and what we need to know about him. God has given his holy word uh, so that we know precisely when nature leaves off and then God introduces himself he answers that question in the very first chapter Genesis 1 1 how who did all of this in the beginning God how did he do all this he spoke it into being because he wanted to 
God progressively reveals himself more and more through the pages of Scripture until finally he sent his son, Jesus Christ, and now he reveals himself through what we know about Jesus Christ, just like baptism today. That was something that Jesus gave us, a picture. God loves to use picture illustrations of what Jesus did for us on the cross. When Jesus was baptized, Jesus was baptized so that he could show the world what he was getting ready to do. I am going to die on the cross. I'm going to be buried, but you watch. I'm going to rise from the dead. So when we are baptized, like the three that were baptized this morning did, they were saying that I believe in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. I believe that he was buried, and I believe that he rose from the dead. That picture is a beautiful picture. When we hear, what we hear in the and the Lord's law is perfect. It converts our soul. John 1.14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What we hear in the Lord's testimony is sure. Just, just, just look at verse 7. Some of the things it says here. We find that the Lord's testimony is so sure that not only does it convert our soul, but it makes wise the simple. Now, I could say that that should give some of you hope. It gives me hope. It does. But let me just say to you that making the simple wise can be accomplished by knowing the Word of God. If you will take the time to know the Word of God, you will be wise enough to live the abundant life that Jesus wants you to live on this planet. The Lord's testimony in you is a powerful tool for living the abundant life. Uh, Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Colossians 3, 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Why do we sing praises? Why do we use music? Why do we spend half of our service singing things? Because you can remember it with a tune attached to it better than you can by itself. That's why we sing. We sing love songs to the Lord, and it helps us just like the poem that I shared with you a moment ago. You knew it because you knew the song attached to it. But now you not only need to know the tune but you need to know the message oh i find a lot of songs have great tunes tune. brian and i you know and, and, and you know there's a lot of great tunes out there but sometimes the messages stink i mean just stink they're not the truth and they just, you know, I, I'm, I'm a message reader. I, I, I read the poetry of the song. Well, you know, Bob, I'm just listening to the song because I like the beat, you know. Well, okay. But if the message is of the devil, you don't need to be listening to it because you're going to remember that better than you're going to remember anything you read because it will get stuck in your head. Robin, the other day, she said uh, something like, I got this song stuck in my head. She'd heard a jingle on, on a commercial as she was in the living room. And this, I'm not, I don't even remember what it was. And she doesn't want to remember because she doesn't want it stuck there anymore. But it, that's what they're designed for. You know what commercials are designed for? To get in your head and never leave. Do you all remember? I, I bet you. bet you can remember that. I am stuck on Band-Aids because... Did you know that was in there? You know what? That's probably taking up room that you need to remember something else, like, you know, the combination to a lock or, you know, uh, uh, your birth date or something. You know, and it's taking up room in there. I'll never forget, I was talking to my kids about, uh, I think it was the T Berry Shuffle. Y'all remember that commercial, the T Berry Shuffle? Dun, 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 dun. They looked at me like, Dad, what are you talking about? And I thought, oh, that happened in the 70s. <laughs> they were not born until the 80s. And some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about, Bob? But some of you, it's stuck up here. My point in telling you this is that making the wise simple means that we put it in there and keep it. If any of you lacks wisdom, James 1.5 says, let him ask 
ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. If you want real wisdom, ask for it from God and he will give it to you. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to give you the wisdom of the world necessarily, but he will give you his wisdom and he will allow it to stick if you just seek him. When I was saved in my early teens, my reaction to salvation was a sense of knowing that I had done something significant, eternally significant and right. And 44 years later, I still believe that. It makes my heart rejoice. Look at uh, verse 8 here. When we hear what we hear in the Lord's statutes is right, rejoicing the heart. The truth will set you free. Free to accomplish a real purpose as you follow God's design. Free not to worry about death. But rejoice in life here and life beyond in heaven. Free to know what is right and free to do what is right. There is joy in knowing that. I was raised to do right things. Uh, Clinton and Justine Dickerson did a pretty good job of keeping me in line. They, their goal was to teach me to do what is right. So that's my, I, I strive to do that. Even today, I'm not perfect at it, but I strive to do what is right. And with the wisdom I get from God's word, I know what is right. So we find in verses 7 and 8, it's the source of salvation. It gives wisdom. The word brings joy to life and it enlightens our eyes. We're able to see things. I may be the only one. I doubt if I am. But have you ever watched TV and just had the urge to say, now that's bad theology. Have you ever done that? You're watching a movie and you go, now that's bad theology. I challenge you to do that someday. One whole night, just sit there. And everything that you watch, compare it to what you know of God's Word. And say, let's say, you know, the, the lead characters are, uh, it's a romantic film, and the lead character, you're so wanting them to get together, and they do on their first date, they end up in bed together. Is that good theology? But you know, the way the movie, the way, and it may not, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, PG movies. I'm not talking about the bad ones, really bad ones. But the theology is bad in that. But we've become so used to it now that, oh, that's so nice. They got together. They didn't get married or they didn't make a commitment to each other. They just uh, came together. And we look at that and go, oh, that's so nice. That's the whole point of the movie and it's bad theology. It's bad, bad theology. You see, when we hear the Lord's commandments, the Lord's commandments are pure and helps to enlighten our eyes to things that are not pure. God's word is alive and it's powerful. It's inspired. Well, what does that mean? It means that when you read this word that God uniquely through the power of his Holy Spirit speaks to your unique circumstances and will answer the questions that you're asking. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. These are not magic words. They are just words that are right and pure and righteous and inspired and illuminated by God himself to speak to whatever life situation that you may find yourself in at the given moment. The word of God when you're reading it, the Holy Spirit is like having the author of the book whispering in your ears, although he's not whispering in your ears. If you're saved, he is speaking to your spirit from the inside, telling you what the insight that you need about what you're reading. God's instructions are not only pure, but they are eye-opening when you read them in a good and, and righteous way. The fear of the Lord is clean, it says in this psalm. Enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. I like that word, all together. That's the way it is in, in, in the New King James Version that I'm reading. What does that mean? That means that you put the whole thing together in context, and it's right. All together. All of it, of the Word of God, fits together. Memorizing and sharing the word of God during spiritual battles is something that the devil cannot defeat. What Kevin was singing about a few moments ago is so true. The devil is prowling around like a hungry lion seeking whom he may devour. And he will devour you if you don't have protection. Jesus proved the way you protect yourself from the devil is by knowing the word of God. 
How many of you have ever had a computer that was attacked by a virus? Isn't that horrible? Some of you are going, I don't have a computer. Well, good for you. You've never had this experience. But for those of you that do, if you get a virus, poor Robin had a virus in her computer. And my son who, you know, I called him up and I said, uh, you know any good computer guys that I might uh, call that could help me with this computer? Dad, you know that that's what I do. Okay, well, come help your mother. And so he worked hours one night just trying to get that thing and he got it back up to where it would come on and Robin was working with it and poof, it went back out again and he said a virus got it and I have not been able to figure out how to overcome that virus in your system but what about the viruses that are affecting our systems you're having it bombarded at you every single day in what you read and in what you, you know, and what you see on TV. And you can't help it. It's in the news shows. It's, it's everywhere. You have to be able to look with a discerning eye and understand that there are so many things being taught out there and, and just assumed to be the right way to go. It's like Satan is trying to infect us with a virus. And the only antivirus program that will successfully keep you from getting infected is to have the word of God in your heart. These words I will hide in my heart that I may not sin against God. It's the only antivirus protection you've got from Satan's lies and the things that he's trying to get our nation to believe that are not thus saith the Lord. Well, let me give you an example. Let's say... For instance, and I'm making this up, uh, let's say, for instance, a, 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 I was out somewhere visiting and, and a, a young lady come up to me and said, you know, I'd really like to have an affair with you. Now, honey, this is an example. It is an illustration. We're not going to need to have a talk later because this did not happen, okay? This is just an illustration. For those of you watching on TV, that's my wife, okay? But let's say she said that. First of all, I hate euphemisms that detract from what it really is. An affair. You know what an affair is? I want to have an immoral relationship with you and do things that, that are absolutely sinful. Oh, let's have an affair. <laughs> you know? Euphemisms that do not cut to what they want. So what, what, how would I deal with that? Well, the first thing that I would want to do is, and, and probably would pop into my head, Gail, would be, that's number seven of the Ten Commandments. Number seven says, thou shalt not commit. So that would be my first thing. I would think, okay, I have agreed when I was baptized and, and every day of my life I have agreed, I have confessed Jesus is my Lord. If Jesus is my Lord, what have I said to him? You get to call the shots. I only do what you want me to do. So, or I don't do, I don't do something if you said not to do it. So if he says, do not commit adultery, which means having an immoral relationship with someone who is not my wife, I would start there. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And then if I needed more information or more ammunition, as it may be said, I could think, well, you know, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. So I've been commanded to love my wife. And I could go on and on and on about scriptures that would bolster uh, what I should do. Not to mention the fact that my wife has a license of exclusivity that I gave her my word that I would cling unto her and to ho her only as long as as we both shall live. Matthew 19, 4 through 6 says, Jesus said, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Or the old King James says, do not allow to be put asunder. So I could just, all those scriptures come back and say, okay, here's some really good reasons not to do this. Number one, God said it. And number two, my wife will kill me. That's not in scripture, but it, it's the truth. <laughs> I made the decision a long time ago. 
and I keep my word to God and I keep my word to those God have given me to love. And if you would make a decision in your life that you are going to abide by the Ten Commandments and the rest of what God's Word says, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about whether you're going to do something immoral or not. You don't have to think about whether you're going to covet what somebody else has. You're not going to think about stealing or all those other things. If you have the Word of God in your heart and in your mind, temptations are going to be so much easier to overcome because you've already decided and so if that woman came to me, I would say, look, this has nothing to do with you. It has to do with a decision I made years ago that I am going to do what my God whom I love says and I am going to love my wife as I promised her that I would and nourish and cherish her until death do us part. Well, what are we to do with the revelation of God? Let me quickly finish up in verse 14. I love this verse. Let the words of my mouth. In other words, let what I say match up with what the word of God teaches. If things are coming out of your mouth in any area of your existence, if they are not acceptable to the Lord, then you need to nip it in the bud and stop saying those things. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable to you. What comes out of our mouth it's dependent on what we've put in it. Let the words of my mouth be acceptable to my Lord. And the meditation of my heart be acceptable to my Lord. I'm going to tell you that's where we mess up the most. The meditation of my heart. Whatever you spend the most time on putting in your head, it's going to crowd out all the other things. The meditations of my heart be acceptable to my Lord. What am I spending time on? If I'm focusing my thinking on the right things, then the right things will come out in how I talk and how I walk. It's like the old hammer illustration. You got a hammer in your head, and, or in your hand rather, and some people do, uh, a hammer in your hand, and you go down to hit that nail and you miss and you hit that thumb. You know what? Whatever comes out of your mouth at that moment is what's inside. It's what's inside. And you may go, oh, no, I'm just doing that because it hurt. Think of the sponge. Whatever you squeeze out of the sponge is what was inside. And if that's what's coming out, then you know that there's something wrong inside. When you come up against hard times and become desperate, then what's inside of you is how you will cope. If you have Jesus inside and his word is what you've been meditating on, then it will guide you back to the paths of righteousness and the doors of opportunity that God has for you there. Things, for the most part, that come out of you should be Galatians 5, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And you may be saying, Bob, why are you telling me this? You know, this seems kind of obvious. Because God created you to live with his supernatural intervention. Yes, he's all around. He keeps the world put together. Everything you see in nature is to show you just how awesome he is and how able he is to keep things going. Everything you can hear from his word is designed to give you supernatural insight in how to defeat the enemy that Kevin was singing about. Live abundantly and bring glory to God. And you say, but Bob, I've, I've tried... I, I'm just not very good at it. Well, I've got some absolutely wonderful news for you. You don't have to do it by yourself because the Lord, look at the last few words. Oh, Lord, my rock or my strength and my redeemer. He is our strength. He is our firm foundation. He is the one who paid the price to redeem us from the grips of the evil one and his power has been taken away and we have been made free 
what you see and what you hear is that God is God is able would you bow your heads with me today as we come to the time of decision I would challenge you if you do not believe in God if you do not believe in Jesus that today would be the day that you would simply pray the prayer and you may say well I don't even believe enough to pray a prayer I challenge you to go ahead and do it anyway just say God if you're real show me and my prayer for you in just a moment is that he will be prepared be prepared if you're here today and you realize that there's something that you need to do that is eternally right and you need you saw it in the baptism you heard it in the singing and you've heard it in God's word being read you know that you need God in your life because it's right you can do that by saying Lord, Lord please forgive me of my sins I want to exchange my way of doing things for you I want to go your way instead of my way I want to repent I believe in you Jesus that you lived on this earth that you died on the cross that you were raised from the dead and I believe that you are the son of God I confess you as my Lord and I pray to receive you into my life please save me right now maybe you've prayed that prayer and you know that you've repented but you've never followed through in the first commandment that the Lord gave you after repentance repentance comes first and then baptism to show forth a confession that he is your Lord and that he is who you are following he set that standard not me you need to be baptized if you've never been baptized after repenting of your sin or maybe you're here today and and uh, you know that God is real but there's something going on in your life and you just feel overwhelmed by it I'm going to pray for you in just a moment that God will help you and God will love you through it and show you the way Father as I come to you in prayer right now I pray first of all for those who are unbelievers I pray Father that you will show them that you are real Lord you've promised us in this psalm that we can see you in the heavens that the heavens declare your glory so I pray father that for those who are unbelievers in our midst today that Lord you would show them in your creation but I pray also father that you will show them in your word that they will hear the scriptures father and that they will know that they are true and that you will just allow the scriptures to be broadcast to them in multiple ways so that they will have to hear the word and I pray that they will accept, not reject. And Father, for those that are here in the building today, give them courage to do what you are calling them to do right now. And I pray, Father, if someone has an overwhelming problem in their lives, that you would show forth the way to your open doors. In Jesus' name, amen.